Fisher and I or podcast coming away. Steve Smee here in the Rickster. What's up? Hey, what's up, Steve? What's up, guys? How's everybody doing out there? Yes, sir. How's everyone doing? So this is Q&A episode 373. And guys, we have five really, really fun topics, including uh, we're going to finish it up with a marriage question. But the first four are all steroid related, hardcore steroid questions. First one is thoughts on synthol to bring up calf. So this has been a recurring theme with people, Rick. Uh, people are really, really self-conscious about their calves out there. And I don't have that problem. Um, I have really, really good calves. Uh, just my genetic makeup, having smaller limbs. You have Ditto. Long- Ditto. Uh-huh. Me too. Yeah. If, you, if you've got long, lanky limbs, the thing is, in that situation, your muscles are going to be long and lanky as well. So you're not going to get that peak. So I've seen guys who are, uh, you don't necessarily have to be a tall person, you know, necessarily. But yeah, most of the time, the taller guys over, you know, six foot tall and up crowd, sometimes they'll have that kind of genetic makeup where they have long, lanky limbs. So they have a hard time building up a peak in their bicep, building up a peak in their calves. I've seen, you know, a lot of taller guys, you know, they've got a pretty good upper body, decent upper body, but they got no legs. They got no, no wheels at all. And their calves don't even look like they work out their calves, even though they do. So at the end of the day, you know, genetics plays a role, guys. Um, not everybody can be like Lee Priest. You know, Lee Priest is what, 5'3", five, 5'4", five, in height? And he's got huge biceps, huge calves. He's got the genetics. He's got the bodybuilding genetics, and he has the genetics to have big peaks in his muscles, okay, that are on his limbs, leg limbs, arm limbs. But not, not everybody can have that. So at the end of the day, you have to you have to accept that. If you're a guy with long, lanky limbs, just accept it. You know, you're never going to have as big a calves or as big as a biceps as some of these other guys out there. So that's step one. Step two, the nice thing about weight training is you can still push yourself to improve and get stronger, get stronger calves, get bigger calves, even if they're not ever going to grow like some of the other muscles on your body, maybe like your back, for example, because if you've got a long, lanky limb, your back is probably going to be much better than someone with, with my genetic makeup or, or Rick's genetic makeup. So it works both ways. So in this situation, you have to kind of also not give up on it. And you have to see, keep pushing on them. And um, a lot of guys want to ask, I see this question a lot on the forums. Should I work my calves high rep, low weight, or should I work my calves high weight and low rep? And my answer to that is both. I mean, I do both. I, I like to lift heavier with low reps and I like to get that burn going and do high reps lower weight to really really get that burn so it works both ways on that as well so at the end of the day so those are some suggestions for you with the calves and at the end of the day synthol I'm not particularly a fan of messing around with synthol um synthol is basically and I'm I'll let Rick get, get into the science behind how, how synthol works, but I've seen guys with synthol in the gym. Um, I live in a area of the country and Rick does as well, where, you know, people got money, you know, people got money in my um, neck of the woods and in Rick neck of the woods. And when you got an excess amount of money, you tend to st- spend money on things that a normal person does not need a, a, a normal working stiff like myself would never spend a hundred dollars on a haircut. I don't even pay to get my hair cut. I could cut it myself. I'm, I'm that poor. But, you know, a lot of guys, I see guys walk around with implants, with calf, calf implants. I see guys walking around with synthol. I see guys doing everything they can to get, get, get you know, a, a look that they're looking for. So it's weird to me to see that. But to them, they're so self-conscious and insecure about their calves that they're willing to actually inject a fucking chemical into their body to give themselves bigger muscles. So I'll let you, Rick, explain the science behind synthol. 
Um, I know back in the day in the EF forum, we used to have actually a sponsor on the forum that actually sold synthol to people and people would use it and post pictures and stuff. And, you know, I never really was, was that interested in actually trying it. So I admittedly have never tried it. So I apologize for those of you out there who are getting pissed and saying, oh, Steve, you've never used it. What do you know about it? You know, and that is true. I have not used it. So I'm not, I'm not here to bash it, but I'm just telling you, I personally have no interest in using it. And I personally would not advise it to be used, but I'll, I'll let Rick uh, explain uh, more about the science behind synthol. Well, the way that synthol works is that you inject it into the muscle that you want to make larger. And synthol is a thicker oil than your steroids are. It creates a, a, a depot. It creates an empty spot. I shouldn't say empty because it's full of oil. So it creates a spot that is full of oil inside of your muscle. And as your body begins to absorb that oil dissipate, some scar tissue is formed where that oil used to be. Um, now, unlike steroids that dissipate quite quickly, where the oil goes away quite quickly, uh, synthol lasts longer, long enough for your muscle to create some scar tissue, some scarring where that spot, that depot where you injected the synthol used to be. And that is where you get the growth, uh, the cosmetic uh, growth coming from synthol that you don't really quite get from steroids. The problem or the main issue that you will run into with synthol is that it's very hard to control how that scar tissue forms. It's very hard to make it shape just right, just the way you want. So if you're using synthol more than just a little tiny bit on, on just a, a muscle or two that needs some help, if you're trying to build a whole bicep out of synthol, a whole peck out of synthol, it's going to be not formed properly. The, the, way, the shape of it, it's going to be misshapen because all you're basically doing is creating, is creating scar tissues. You create, you creating knots of scar tissue using the synthol is what you're doing. So, so Rick, let me ask you this. Have you ever used it? And would you ever use it? And would you ever advise to be used? Absolutely not. I've never used it. I wouldn't use it. I just don't trust myself making a muscle shaped properly, shooting the right amount in the right spot on both sides. And I, I've just seen too many pictures of these freaks on synthol. They look terrible and I wouldn't want to, to mess with it. Also, my main goal is not aesthetics. My main goal is not just to look good. The performance aspects of my body that I like, that I still enjoy quite a bit. And so I think that adding scar tissue in between my muscles is not going to be conducive to my performance, to, to my performing at the level that I do now. And so synthol is just not something that works for me. If I, if I was, you know, competing and that's the only thing my, I, I'm, I want my body to be able to do is look good on a stage with, with some, some tanning fluid and oil. And I guess why not? I guess synthol might, might, might be necessary, but when it comes, I mean, I mean, I'm doing jujitsu, I'm mountain biking, I'm doing Thai boxing, I'm doing, I'm, I'm jogging, I'm doing a lot of different things, a lot of different activities that require me to have just actual mobility for my muscles to, to be flexible and strong. And I just don't, uh, I don't see synthol and, and knots of scar tissue in my biceps or my shoulders or, or anywhere really uh, being conducive uh, to and helping me with any of those things. So I, I wouldn't mess with it from the start. I always knew I, I would never fuck with it. Okay. So the next question that came in here, we've never really discussed this. This is kind of like one of these hypothetical versus hypothetical ones. And, um, you know, we see this discussed on, on some forums. We see this discussed on social media and, you know, you can debate this, for an entire show. So Rick and I are going to kind of get, debate this one. And basically the question is 500 milligrams per week of let's say testosterone. Okay. Or any steroid and not lifting versus no steroids and lifting. What would be the difference in those two situations? 
So Rick, I'll bring you in early on this. How would you answer this? And what do you think about this question? Um, I mean, what your results are going to be at the end? Whatever you want to interpret it. Um, I mean, obviously results, it's not a black and white answer. You can't say, oh, you're going to gain 5.6 pounds with scenario A and you're going to gain 2.2 pounds with scenario B. But what do, you, what do you think about like the the question itself and how would you answer this? If someone Look, if came up to you. Um, if you're um, scenario number one, you're shooting 500 mix of test. I'm going to assume it's prop because it's short, shorter, faster acting and you wouldn't see much or notice a lot from an athlete in two weeks like that. So 500 makes a prop a week for two weeks. You're not lifting, but let's say you're in a caloric deficit. Uh, you're going to maintain more muscle mass. You're going to look leaner. Uh, you won't, your muscles will, won't look great. If you've been lifting all the way up until then and you stop lifting, they'll get flat. If you've never lifted before and you continue to not lift, and you pump 500 mg of prop for two weeks, and maybe you go on a little caloric deficit, you'll look leaner. You look all right. If you're not in a caloric deficit, if you don't do anything, you just pump 500 mg of test prop a week, you're going to continue to look like nothing. It's not going to do anything. Now, as far as just lifting and not being on the sauce, again, if you were doing no sauce up until then, and then you start lifting. Most guys will see something in two weeks, the first couple of weeks. Newbies, new guy, just get into the gym. I mean, you're going to see something weekly for a whole year if you've never lifted before. So it'll make a difference for sure. If you've been using steroids before with lifting, and then you stop using the, the sauce, and you keep lifting, chances are you're going to see a little bit of decrease in mass. If you take away the steroids, um, I mean, those, I mean, get, I guess, I guess it's a multi, uh, sided answer, but there's a lot of different scenarios that could make this play out. So yeah, there's no lifting, um, with steroids. You'd only see something positive. If you're in a caloric deficit, you see some leanness and then the, the no steroids with lifting, you'd only see something really positive. If you're a newbie, new guy started lifting if you were like a jogger somebody who used to run or bike ride or box or something then you started hitting the weights hard for a couple of weeks you'd see something for sure if you're always natural and you maintain natural you always be fine um, now if you're coming off a cycle like 500 makes a proper week you come off for two weeks you continue to lift and you're going to see some some decrease in size it's, it's just it just go to the territory unless it was your first cycle if it was your very first cycle, you might, you might hold on to that mass for much longer. But third, fourth, fifth cycle, come off, two weeks of just lifting, shorter acting esters, right? Because if you're taking EQ and DECA, two weeks later, you're still in the sauce. So I'm assuming you're taking prop, two weeks get off, see some, some decreases in muscle size. What do you think, Steve? Yeah, like I said, this isn't a black and white issue. I think it's silly to run steroids and not lift. If you're going to run steroids, you want to make sure you're conditioned fully and you're ready to go. But hypothetically, if you were to just run steroids and not lift, you probably fill out, you know, let's say you ran 500 million dollars per week of testosterone with no AI, you would definitely fill out. You would definitely put on weight. You definitely bloat on it. Okay, know that on my mind in most, almost all scenarios. But if you compare that with no steroids and lifting, you know, which is, which is going to make more sense. The bottom line guys, when it comes to building muscle, okay, nothing out there builds muscle, nothing like magic. There's nothing you can take to build muscle. There's nothing you can do to build muscle. Okay. The only thing that you can do to build muscle out there is actually weight and resistance train. That is how you build muscle. I've seen runners who never picked up a weight in their life have absolutely no upper body, so skinny, but they have huge calves. Why is that? Because when a runner runs, he's obviously lifting up on his feet 
and he's engaging his calves and he's ripping his calves, the muscle fibers in his calves. So he's building strong calves and strong legs by just running or bicyclists, same thing with bicyclists. But as a weightlifter, you break down that muscle in the weight room and it's going to grow back stronger. So in that situation, you have to weight train and resistance train to build muscle. You have to train your body. It's just like playing tennis or anything or knitting. You, the more you do it, the more you train your body to be proficient at it. Now with weight training, it goes a step further because in weight training, you're actually doing something to your muscles. You're breaking it down. The normal got people out there who don't aren't gym rats like us, like most of you listening to this, 99% of you that are listening to this, or those of you who are trying to get into it, don't understand this concept. And it's pointless to argue with them on this stuff because they just don't get it. They don't, they don't get it. So it's pointless. So there's no reason to ever argue with someone over this or whatever. Just let them be. You're a weightlifter. You lift weights. Stick to it. You will train your body over time. You will build muscle memory over time. You could even stop weight training for a year or two. If you've been weight training for 10 years and you stop weight training for two years, then you get back into it. You will get back to where you were, okay, in no time. But someone who's never weight trained in their life, who starts weight training at the same time as you start weight training, after like a month, you're going to be way ahead of them. You're going to be way ahead of them, even if they're training harder than you, even if they're eating the best food in the world and taking steroids and everything, you will still be ahead of them because of muscle memory. So the lesson to this question is you must start weight training. You must start weight training as soon as possible, 14, 15 years old, start weight training, start resistance training, but do it smart. And then when you get older, that time you put in will pay off in the long term. So Absolutely not. Absolutely. If, if, the, if this person who sent in this question is trying to say, I can just take 500 milligrams of, of steroids a week and not lift, and I'm going to get further than someone who does no steroids and does and, and lifts, then no, it's not true. You're not going to get further because steroids aren't magic. You actually have to weight train because you're training your body and you're breaking down the muscle in the process. So you know, and look, at the end of the day, if you think I'm wrong on this, prove me wrong. Go run steroids and don't lift and sit, sit, sit your ass on the couch, drinking beer, eating potato chips, and see if you can build muscle doing that. Because I promise you, it ain't that easy. If it was that easy, everybody in America would be muscular and be benching 500 pounds right now. But they're not. It is not that easy. Even guys who run steroids and weight train have a hard time building muscle and they end up just quitting the gym. You know, uh, I used to know a gym owner, you know, what he told me, he's like, gym, you, you don't, you don't increase the amount of people in your gym. The only time that ever happens is if the gym down the street goes bankrupt and closes, then people go to your gym initially, but you can never actually grow membership at a gym because people quit more people will quit than actually sign up to the gym over time. Because people realize, you know what? I'm not getting the results, so I'm just going to quit. I don't want to do this anymore. So that's that's the thing. You want to move on, Rick, or you want to add anything? Take it. I think, I, think, I, think, I think we're good to go, man. I think, I think you summed it up perfectly. All right. And then the next one, guys, the third one we're going to talk about, test masteron ratio, testosterone masteron ratio. What should your ratio be? We talk about – I wrote a uh, stacking steroid uh, article – and I can link that in the uh, description notes for those of you who um, are on Evolutionary or iTunes. I, I can link it for you. And if you're on YouTube, you can always go to a forum and, and check out that link. But it's uh, you know very easy, evolutionary.org, stacking steroids. You can just Google it if you want. And I wrote an article. So stacking steroids is a method to the madness. And that's, what, that's the thing I write. And when you stack steroids, it's very important to realize what you're stacking. So testosterone and masteron. Masteron is the DHT derivative. It's a hardener. So if you stack it with testosterone and you're running testosterone at a lower dose, the masteron can actually act as an aromatized inhibitor. But if you're running testosterone at a higher dose, say like 250, 400, 500, et cetera, then masteron is not going to be enough 
to combat estrogen. So if your question is, is can I run testosterone and then use the master on as my AI? And will that, will that solve my water retention? The answer is, is not necessarily. Um, it just depends on what, what uh, dosage of testosterone you use. So that's the way I interpret this question. You could also be interpreting it like I want to stack testosterone with Masteron. What ratio should I use? You could be asking that. In that situation, guys, in a, in a, in a, stat, in a stack, I always recommend 300 to 500 milligrams of Masteron a week in a stack. If you want the hardening benefits of Masteron, then that would, that, would, that would make sense. But if you're running a bunch of testosterone, 500, 750 milligrams, 1,000 milligrams, and you want to run Masteron to harden you up, that testosterone is going to soften you. It's going to soften you up. So that might not be the best cycle for you. If you're going to run a bunch of tests and then just throw 500 milligrams of Masteron, to me, that seems like a waste. And another thing that seems like a waste is Masteron in most situations is going to be a waste because if you're not competing or you like to go to a show or something, is there really a point in running Masteron? I mean, is it an egotistical thing? Do you just want to look hard in the gym? Do you want to look more mas ma uh, vascular in the gym? Do you just looking like looking at yourself doing bicep curls in front of the mirror? Okay, yeah, I enjoy that. I enjoy watching the, the veins pop out of my Yeah, so, yeah, I mean, so that sums it up, guys. All right, Rick, and uh, Rick, tell us what you think about the ratio. I mean, these are questions. These are very vanilla questions, but they're really good questions. You just have to, it depends how they're being interpreted, you know? So next question is we're talking about testosterone master on ratios, right? What's the best way to use it? Yeah. What's the best ratio? Um, it depends on what you're looking for. Um, depends on what you're looking for. Really. Uh, if you are just adding master on in as a little bit of an anti-estrogen, you know, hundred mix to 50 mix master on is fine. If you're doing some serious kind of leaning out some cutting, you could run Masteron with test 100 mix to 100 mix one to one, or even run a little bit more Masteron than, than testosterone. You know what I mean? It's just, it's this, this is one of those questions where you need to have some experience and experiment to yourself and see what kind of works for you. It there really isn't a one size fits, fits all answer, in my opinion. So just got to experiment, but guidelines to just go off by half of Masteron depending on your test. So if you're running 500 mix of tests, 250 master on be good. Or if you're doing, you know, 500 tests, you could do 500 master on. It's actually not a bad ratio either. And you get, you'll look a lot leaner on that cycle. So that, that's all I have to say about that. But you got to experiment. You got to experiment and see what kind of works for you. That's all I have to say about that. Remember that from Forrest Gump? That's all I got to say about that. Yeah, it was a big movie back in the mid '90s, and when Rick and I were teenagers. All right, guys. So the next one is weird estrogen numbers and blood work on trend. And this question comes up every now and then. It's a very important question. So why do we say don't run trend when you don't have experience? Why? Because we're just, you know, we're trying to save the trend for ourselves. We don't want you getting gains, blah, blah, blah. This is what the, the, the young guys think. And some of the older guys too. But the reality is this is a perfect reason, Rick, why you should not run trend when you're not experienced. Because when you run trend on a cycle and you run it with testosterone and you run blood work mid-cycle because you're, you're having gynecomastia problems, estrogen issues, et cetera, you run blood work your estrogen is going to be all over the place because trenbolone can show up as estrogen, even though it's not affecting estrogen, it can still show up in estrogen. So you're not going to know where your estrogen levels are on cycle. If you run trend with test. So this is why you don't run trend with test on a cycle when you're first starting out, especially. So you run the test on its own. You see how you react. You see how much AI you need. You learn, you learn, you learn, and then you can add in trend later and you'll know exactly how much of an AI you need because trend does not aromatize into estrogen, but testosterone does. The second part of the equation is when you're running a standard E2 test, the, Ro the Roish ECLI method, which is one of the more um, most run tests when you're running your estrogen, especially if you're going not through your doctor, not through your insurance, but you're doing this on your own. 
which I recommend guys do, especially if you don't have good insurance and especially if you don't want to have to go through a doctor and explain to the doctor, I need this, I need this, I need this. And then he gives you the, the paperwork and you go get blood work done and you get blood work back and half the stuff that you wanted is not on there because he didn't listen to you. So I like to do, I like to cut to the chase and get my own blood work. If you go on evolution.org, Steve SMI, look at my signature, look at my blood work thread. It's chock full of information on getting blood work on your own. But here's the thing. When you get blood work on your own, you've got to make sure that you're using the LCMS method when you get blood work done. So when you, when you check to see the blood work, when you're going to order the blood work, if you do it on your own, in, or if you go through a doctor, you have to mention that to them. You have to mention that if you want accurate estrogen results, because if not, the trend can definitely screw around with your estrogen numbers. So that, that would be something to, to be aware of, okay? Because some guys will run trend on a cycle and they'll come back and think, oh my God, my, my estrogen levels are like five times normal. And then I'll be like, well, did you run blood work through a doctor? Did you run it on your own? They're like, no, I ran it on my own. I said, okay, you can run it on your own. But did you use the Ro Roche method or did you use LCMS? And they'll be like, I don't know. I'm like, well, I mean, I can't really help you. You've got to know what you run. So at the end of the day, you want to make sure you're running the most accurate type of blood work if you want to accurate estrogen numbers but at the end of the day you know you know either way you really should know how much steroids that you, you can run how much testosterone debo whatever anything that aromatizes how much of that should you run versus how much of an ai you need this way when you're running trend and you have to run blood work something happens is the emergency you run blood work and then the number is off so you'll know but but I would, I would, if you're in that situation, if you're in that boat right now, check your blood work online and see if you're ordering the one that's LCMS. And that will prevent that from happening when you run trend. Anything else you want to add to that, Rick? I think you covered this one uh, fully, buddy. I'm not going to, I don't have anything else to add on it. All right, guys, so we're going to move on to the next one. So this is one for you, Rick. Uh, let me pull up this uh, this one that she wrote in. Let's see here. Blah, 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 blah. All right. Uh, P okay, she wants to know about PT141, which is a, a peptide. So she says, I did not have sex until marriage, so I did not know this. But after marrying, I noticed my husband has no desire in sex, nor can he get it up when we try. It is really embarrassing because we are both attractive and this is the only thing bad about our marriage. He makes a lot of money. We live in a mansion. Everyone thinks we are the perfect couple and we aren't. We haven't been to therapy. We have been to therapy and tried dick pills and they aren't working. I spend every night alone in my living room crying on my iPad, trying to figure out how to fix this without getting dicked by some guy from the bar or work. Well, I came across a peptide called PT141 and wondering if you knew a source and your experiences with this, would it help him? So PT4141 is a peptide that you can actually inject sub-Q. And for some people, it increases libido. But at the end of the day, if your husband isn't into you, you know, something is wrong here. So even if he took this and his libido went up, it doesn't sound like this would solve the issue. So you know, um, this is, you know, one dimensional thinking um, where people want to take something to fix it. But this is a root cause issue that's going on in this marriage. So, Rick, uh, you heard what she said. It's, it's, it's kind of a sad situation. She's crying on her iPad in her living room every night trying to find out. Sounds like she's going like on her iPad all night and Googling how to fix this. And she came across this because she thinks this could fix it. Am, am I wrong on that? What do you think? Yeah, there's something else at play here. You know, there's no reason why uh, this guy doesn't have desire, especially the newly married. So he's, you know, it's it's a new, it's a new thing for him. He should be should be all over it. And I mean, when she says this, he has no interest in sex. 
is it that maybe he's they're having sex once a day, once every other day, and she still doesn't feel that's enough? Because that could happen. <clears throat> um, it's another good reason to not hold off sex until you, after you're married, because you might run into this problem where you're not sexually compatible in that way. And you held off, which I mean, sounds beautiful. Don't have sex until you get married. Sounds sounds incredible. Sounds very pure. Buddy, that's uh, you don't watch Lifetime movies. That's what happens in the Hallmark movies all the time. That's bro. that it sounds beautiful. But uh, what if you're not compatible sexual sex wise? What if one person wants more than the other can give? What if uh, you know he's too big? What if he's too small? You know, I mean, it 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 could go either way. You know. So it's just that wasn't a good play. That wasn't a good move to not 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 test out the merchandise before you got married. And now. And now you got to figure out what could be going on, really, uh, if you're going to counseling, what is what is what's being said in counseling? I mean, are you guys having sex at least twice a week minimum? I mean, two, three times a week. Some guys, that's all they want a couple of times a week. Um, there could be some porn addiction too. This dude could maybe not not be into just plain old sex anymore. He might be uh, hiding out in the shed and, and whacking it, or uh, he could already be in love with someone else. I mean, I hate to throw this stuff out there, but it could be an extreme case of something like that going on. But you know, there's. Some of these relationship questions, you, you, you know, you need more information or really give a good answer. And this one, I'd like to know what's been said in counseling so far. I mean, is she saying, hey, you're not giving me dick as many times a week as, as I think is fair. And is she saying, oh, I already give you plenty of dick. That should be enough. You know, is that what the play out is? Or is he saying, I mean, what, what, what is being said? What's being said? Um, another question, how does, you know, when she wants sex, what does she go and start blowing on it? What, what kind of, uh, what kind of reaction is she getting from him when she starts performing oral sex on him and, and tries to get, get it up? Is he just not able to perform or is he pushing it away saying stop? Or is he sitting there watching her and, it, and it's just not, and it's just not going. That, that's important. That's an important, uh, question. So. No, no, that's a lot to it. It seems like it, d it definitely needs to be more information sent over to us, at least to me, for me to give her a good, good advice on this. But for now, it's look, either he's physically able and just not into you because he's in love with someone else, because uh, maybe he's in a, he's got a porn addiction, because maybe you don't smell so fresh down there. That could happen too sometimes. I mean, men don't talk about this, but... Sometimes some girls, we just, we just not into the way her, her body naturally smells. Um, and he didn't know this until after marriage. And then the other side of it is that he's just not physically able to, he's just not physically able to get it up. And it could be psychological issues. It could be hormonal issues. It could be problems with his hardware. You know, his hardware down there might be uh, lacking for whatever reason. So first determine that. If it's just physically not able or if he's just not into her. And then you could go about fixing the problem, but just shooting a peptide into the guy and, and you haven't quite figured out if it's just he's not into you, but he can get it up or if he just can't get it up at all. You got to figure that out first before you start self-medicating and doing things right. My opinion. What do you think, Steve? Well, I mean, if you're into sex, if she sounds like she's into sex a lot. Why get married if you're into sex? Married people don't have sex. You know what I'm saying? No, so, like, some, some, some married people bang more than than uh, single people. That's for sure. Some, not not everyone, but some. <laughs> That's a, there was a Bill Maher episode where he had a sex therapist on. He said that, exactly what he said. And then the sex therapist, he's like, actually, married people have sex more than single people. And he started laughing. He didn't believe it. So... I mean, I, I know, I know that's true. I just like there, the there's some there's some married people that are really good friends. They don't get they're not sick of each other, and they um they'll have really active sex lives. They'll become more attracted to each other as the years go by. They'll they'll focus their uh, their sexual energy on just each other, and 
and they they do well. Some, not every. I think that some, some of the sitcoms we grew up with, Rick. A lot of the sitcoms that those be the inside joke about the the married couple and the husband like is so sick of his wife he doesn't want to you know have sex with her and stuff. So it's like I kind of like I, I like to kind of like make that joke. But yeah, I mean, obviously, if you're a single guy, especially now during the pandemic, it's gonna you know you're not gonna have a, a sex as much as someone that you're actually laying in bed next to. So that is actually true, believe it or not. But um, on a, on a serious note. I think in this situation, people are consistent. So if you're not having sex before marriage and then you get married and you think like magically you're going to be having sex like every day, I know that happens. Um, we should have, used to have a guy on the forum. He was like a Mormon. I don't know if you remember the guy, Rick. And he it was like a virgin until like 25 years old or 26. And he got married and he have sex with his wife every day. And like, so, you know, that happens. I get it. But like, to me, people are consistent. Like in a normal situation, if you're dating someone and you're only having sex once a week or twice a week, and then you think that, oh, I'm going to get married and now it's going to turn into every, uh, every day. That doesn't happen. That don't, don't get your hopes up that that's going to happen. So I would tell her if you were having no sex and then you got married and suddenly you expected, okay, the, the light's going to get turned on and suddenly like he's going to want to have sex every day with you you know, that's wishful thinking. So, you know, people are consistent. You have to date someone and you have to see, am I compatible with them sexually? And if not, you're going to end up in a sexless, sexless marriage, like many marriages, a huge percentage of marriages are sexless marriages. And a sexless marriages is defined as having sex, like maybe a couple times a year. So this sounds like what your situation you're in. So if sex is that important to you, I would consider just going ahead and, you know, it's time to just move on. And it just sounds like this therapist you're going to, they know you're rich. You live in a big mansion. You make a lot of, you guys make a lot of money. He makes a lot of money. The, the therapist knows that. So the therapist is going to want to, yeah, you know, come back a week from now, come back every two weeks. You know, they, they, they got a nice little scam going. It's kind of like going to the chiropractor, you know, they crack your back. Okay. Uh, make an appointment on Wednesday. I'll see you then. It's, it's a nice little scam they got. They, you know, it's like a recurring subscription type of thing. So they, you know, the therapist isn't going to help you. The therapist isn't going to bail you out of the situation, you know, and you kind of like can learn from this. And then and after you're divorced, you can go ahead and like sport fuck, you know, different men, see different dicks, you know, how they feel um, get a sense of that, of, of the sexual experience of being a whore when you're a single di divorced woman, because I've dated divorced women and they love sex. And then you can find the guy, if sex is that important to you, you can find the guy, just find the guy who's the best fuck, you know, go fuck like 20 different guys online that you met online. And then the one rank them in order, make a list. This is number one. This is number two, go down to 20. And then whoever is in the top five best fucks, go ahead and pursue a relationship with say three of them. Okay. Then you can continue sport fucking them. You can alternate, you know, Monday, I'm going with a Steven on a Tuesday. I'm going with, you know, Richard uh, on Wednesday, I'm going with a Patrick, you know, and then you can kind of whittle it down from there. And then you can go ahead and marry one of those suckers and then, and then make sure there's no prenup. And then you can go ahead and just, you know, have a great sex, sexual marriage. And then you'll be complaining about something else he's doing. You know what I'm saying? Like, so at the end of the day, you're still going to screw yourself. So. Uh, damn, damn, Steve. Why do you hate women? No, I love women. I'm giving her advice, bro. I'm giving her good advice. How am I hating women? I'm giving her good fucking advice. That's what you got to do. That's what you did after your divorce. Um, look, man. It's not that hard to find someone that you're sexually compatible with. I don't think you need to find 20 guys. I think most people, if they like each other enough, um, they'll be, they'll be it's pretty, it's pretty easy to find compatibility. Um, but you know, you already got married. Might as well work on this first and see yeah. what's up. Dude, she's only had sex with this guy. You're telling me she doesn't need to bang. You can't get good at sex. Did she say that? That she only had sex with him? That's it? It says, I did not have sex until marriage, so I didn't know this. So, I mean, oh, hypothetically, okay. if she never had sex before, she doesn't know what she's doing. 
you've got to practice. It's just like weight training. You got to, you got to train yourself. So fuck. Yeah. Go fuck a bunch of guys. Wear protection, you know, very protection. Don't want to be spreading the COVID. You don't want to spread the STDs, but you got to get good at it. You know what I'm so, saying? So, Maybe so, so wear a face mask and a condom. So you don't spread the COVID at the STD. Maybe. Maybe she's just bad at sex and he doesn't want to have sex with her and he's banging his secretary. Did you ever think of that? What can a female do to be bad at sex, really? I mean, like, what, what uh, could she do to be bad at sex? All she's got to do is be hot and, I mean, she doesn't have to do much. Most of it is up to us, isn't it? Wouldn't you agree? No, there's some bad, <laughs> some women who are bad at it, bro. Like, like, how? Might... like what could she not do or, or, or like to be bad at it? Dude, it's a skill. It's a skill, just like anything else. You gotta be, you gotta have that chemistry. You gotta have the physical chemistry. Bro, I do everything. She don't gotta do nothing. Yeah. Just look good. Yeah. Just yeah, look good. Look good and get loud when when it when it's good. That's it. I don't need much All else. Right. All right, let's confirm this. Conchita's <laughs> on the line. Conchita, can you confirm uh, what Rick is saying? Yeah, I don't. I don't know. I don't know how how women can be that bad at sex I and mean, what does she need to maybe what maybe because she doesn't know how to perform oral maybe i mean that's a skill oral is a skill dude of course it's a skill are you kidding me you, you dude oral is a skill all right i, I guess that I, I guess i guess if her, this is if, what she should do go on amazon order a dildo okay order different color dildos so it, it kind of reenacts the different guys you're gonna be banging and you can practice on the dildos practice spend the next fucking Five months practicing. Nah, she probably she probably better off with uh, uh getting a website subscription where there's a lot of oral sex and she could watch and practice with her order man. Be a good idea. They, yeah, that's what you want. Women, women, learn, them, women, like, women learn better right. from watching other women do it. That's Please the, get that's serious, good. okay? We're not at the club, okay? Please get serious. I'm giving her sound advice, and you're telling her to go on the webcam. No wonder yeah, she could she could she up. could get she could get uh nah, not a webcam she could get like a subscription to one of those uh um X rated sites where they do like onlyblowjobs.com or something like that. By the way, I don't know if that's a real URL, probably is, but uh and just watch other women perform oral sex and she'll learn she'll learn that way better than than, than trying to just grab a dildo and practice on her own. Just watch a pro do it. Mia Khalifa is pretty darn good in her films performing oral so. Maybe uh, is that what Wait. is that her? Me, Mia Khalifa is that is that what? Who her? Queen Latifah? Who the no, fuck no, no, Khalifa, the fuck it, the chick, man, the chick who's now like regretting doing porn. Who uh, Paris Hilton? No, no, not the other one. No, oh. let me wow. uh, let me let me Google her, make sure I didn't fuck the name up. Hold on, real quick, real quick. Now every guy that's listening, this is gonna be googling her. Yeah, Mia Khalifa, that's her. Mia Khalifa. Yeah. Yeah, there's a meme of her like playing a flute. Like they 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 changed the, the the penis and put it like a flute in this place. And man, she's rocking it. So watch one of her films and learn that way. I'm sure if her head game got right, her man would be all over her. She, she probably she probably has no head game. The head, if they, it's like it's like it's like Notorious said, if the head if the head is right, Biggie to be there all night. We give you the air night if the head is right. So maybe that's part of the issue. Who knows? Something's up with the dude, man. Because she's a virgin and he's got some experience. He should be all over that. You know, he should, he, he should be he should be all over it. But the fact that he's not, I mean, how bad could she be? At least uh, on the, unless she's got a body odor issue. I mean, how bad could it be? He should be training her. If she has no experience. He should take it upon himself to mold her to his desires. Dude, he's yeah. a virgin too. How the hell is he gonna train her? Oh, he's a virgin too. Oh, oh. it Dude, says they Jesus. never had sex. And the maybe, thing. maybe, maybe he's gay. Like I know this kid that uh, you know, kept saying he was gonna wait until he had, he's gonna get married to have sex and all that, and he just flaming as fuck. I can tell he's flaming as fuck. Then he can just bang her anally and, and she can wear a, like a fucking mask pretending to be a guy and that solves it. That That's pretty insulting to gay people. But all I'm saying is maybe, maybe dude is gay. Dude could be gay. You know, a lot of, a lot, let me tell you something. A lot of these uh, uh, gay guys um, that are born into religious family, they, they, they hide 
behind the whole wait until like we get married kind of thing to, to just be be closet gay. The dude could be in the closet. Were you more religiously? And then when they uh and then when they're in bed, he's like, ew, pussy, ew, yucky. You know, you don't like it. He's really dreaming about some dick. It happens, bro. Even to this day, believe it or not, there's still dudes in the closet. I'll take your word. I'll take your word on that. All right, guys. This was number 373 <laughs> QA, guys. If you have any other questions, please send them in. We will talk to you guys. We will read them on the air again next week. And uh, keep us abreast of the situation, you two, uh, you two crazy kids out there um, in this situation. Keep us abreast of the situation. We hope our advice helped you. For Steve Smee and Rick, this has been number 373. We will talk to you guys next week. Have a good one. Have a good one, Steve. Have a good one, guys. Guys, this is the required legal disclaimer. We are only sharing our experience from years of steroid use. We are not doctors, and none of what we say should be regarded as medical advice. Always check with your doctor before taking any drugs or starting any training program.